Uh, she's the founding president of Eye Cancer Foundation in the Philippines. Uh, she's the vice president of the Cancer Coalition of the Philippines, uh, who was the prime mover behind the Cancer Act, or the National Cancer Integrated Cancer Control passed just in February 2019. So Kara is going to tell us how you got that done. That's the topic. Yes, she sold her soul, I think. How to pass against the act. Kara from the Philippines. Let's give her a big hand. But we all had to go beyond 
uh, our own organization's agenda. And I also have to start thinking beyond the breast cancer survivor. I had to inhabit the shoes of all stakeholders in the community. I had to think like a caregiver, a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, an academician, an insurance provider, etc. And after a few months, the, member of the, co the members of the coalition got used to thinking beyond their cancer specialty. By doing so, we strengthened our own organizations because of new enriching knowledge and perspectives. We each exp expanded our reach as one organization's network, network became the others as well. I think when a group works as one, it can lead to mind-blowing, life-saving ideas and innovation. Working as one makes any group more powerful, purposeful, and productive. And even though we think we know a lot, we actually don't. So the second tip is to get help from those who know better. And I think the magic always happens once you acknowledge you can't do it alone and that you don't have all the answers. It happens when you humble yourself by asking advice, even from people you don't like. <laughs> there are a lot of them. <laughs> One of the persons we consulted was someone who gave a workshop on how to write the bill, a bill that we could submit to Congress. There have been efforts in the past, in fact, 73 attempts in the last 12 years, but none of them passed. So we had to study different cancer control programs and laws abroad and local research, which wasn't really a lot. We also spoke to lobbyists, other NGOs used to engage in Congress. And once we had a basic bill in place, we consulted the different stakeholders to get their input. <coughs> and it was very refreshing to listen to different perspectives after thinking I had seen it all. We met medical societies, patient groups, NGOs, hospitals, schools, industry, experts on finance, importation, labor, education, local and national government, international organizations as well. And some of the stakeholders we reached out to were very wary of us. They seemed worried that the coalition might not include their requests in the bill. Some felt, felt threatened that the bill might threaten their territory. And you know how big that is among doctors. But we understood and listened to everyone's hesitation. And later on, all those who doubted the coalition had a change of heart when they saw the draft bill was submitted to Congress because it included all the requests. And I can honestly say we fought for everyone's asks. And thankfully, the bill was submitted to Congress closely resembled the version they approved. And third, it's nothing new that politics is addition. It's one thing we learn or relearn. <coughs> So we had to shore up all friendships we had with anyone who could help us achieve our goal. But we realized friendships were not enough. For a lot of the lawmakers in Congress, what really mattered was how many votes you can deliver. For example, there was one provision we fought for, and my senator friend, who I thought was my friend, assured us he would include it in his version of the bill. But he did not. He followed the wishes of a group of powerful doctors that insisted on the opposite of what we asked for. The group had a direct link to the constituents of the senator. They could deliver votes in a way they couldn't. It was very disappointing, but we didn't give up. So since politicians wanted numbers, we gave them numbers. During a hearing, a reading, a technical working group session, we would invite different cancer survivors and patients to fill up the rooms and the galleries. Seeing the beneficiaries of the bill gets the attention of the politicians. And oftentimes, we got priority in the reading and discussion of our bill. And of course, not surprising, after the session, the politicians would ask for a photo with all the stakeholders. So there. I think before, a lot of politicians think um, cancer is not an important issue because these patients will die anyway and never get to vote for them. So that's one thing you have to show that there is life after cancer. I'm not even going to get to the part where if you do this, you really need to engage media, have a media plan. I'm not going to get into that, but we did need we did need air cover, which media provided. Um, but in the end, we realized that the direct engagement with the with the decision makers was more key to passing the law. So that we always brought the crowd, stage you know all these events, or brought the crowds to the congressional sessions just to show the politicians, it really mattered, and that there are people behind them that are constituent. And power lies behind the scenes, or behind the throne. Long before the bill passed, we got an audience with the President of the Philippines by accident. 
A close friend of mine phoned me and said he was able to get an appointment with the First Lady at a moment's notice, and he needed for someone in the coalition to meet her that night. It was a holiday and a lot of the coalition members were out of town. Luckily, two female doctors were available, and better yet, one of them spoke the dialect of the First Lady. So I told my friend, okay, we have two people going and I can't send the whole coalition. And he was surprised, what about you? Aren't you going? I'm a TV producer by profession and I had just produced a story on the extrajudicial killings in the Philippines for PBS, a US TV station. So I don't think my presence there would be any helpful in my sabotage the cancer bill, so I didn't go. But to cut the long story short, the, dude, the two doctors met up with the first lady, and a few minutes later, the president dropped in, and he joined the conversation and dominated the conversation. He hit it up with the two doctors and pledged to put the cancer bill on his list of priority legislation. He also arranged for the coalition to present the proposed bill to leaders in charge of his legislative agenda. We thought it was a done deal. We hit the home run. We became complacent after that meeting. We thought he would certify it urgent, but it didn't happen. But I guess that's because the work doesn't end there. You have to cover all ground, up and down and all around. So one thing we realized, the work really happens among the support staff of Congress. We started to work closely with them. They had the power to tell their boss what was urgent. We had to be in constant contact though because there was an infinite number of bills and issues that needed and competed for their attention. Initially, I had a defensive attitude towards the congressional staff. After all, we were approaching 2019 midterm elections and all of them could use the law to win votes for their bosses. But I've learned to respect the congressional staff. Their deep knowledge about the wide spectrum of health-related laws throughout the years is unparalleled. They coached us, shared their valuable wisdom, so that the law would be truly comprehensive and integrated. They worked overtime and maneuvered behind the scenes just so our hearings and technical working group sessions would be calendared without delay. They had a genuine interest in the passage of the bill. And as a journalist, queasy among politicians, I must add, I also met a lot of well-meaning legislators who fought with all their might, especially those whose lives were touched by cancer. And one of her greatest allies was Congresswoman Helen Tan, chairman of the health committee in the lower house and a medical doctor. So I think it is very humbling to experience goodness and greatness where I didn't expect it. Just because you run an advocacy doesn't mean you have a monopoly of good intentions and meaningful work. But it's very humbling. You really need an entire village to get anything done. So that's the president in his home uh, with the doctors. The other doctors were not from the coalition but happened to be there. <coughs> and you always have to keep an open mind. The biggest opposition to the cancer bill was not Congress as we predicted, but the Department of Health. They felt there was no need for the bill. They said there was no problem to address. They had everything under control. In the beginning, the cancer program manager of the Department of Health was a member of the coalition. But a few weeks later, the leadership of the DOH or the Department of Health asked him to leave the coalition. But we kept reaching out to consult them the way we would other stakeholders. Some were supportive, but for the most part, the leadership wasn't very receptive. At the halls of Congress, the DOH opposed us on all issues that were non-negotiable to the coalition, and they lost most of their fight. After the law passed, the next step was for the Department of Health to invite different stakeholders to formulate the Implementing Rules and Regulations, or the IRR of the Cancer Law. The Cancer Coalition, the cancer coalition was invited to be a member of this technical working group. And just when we thought our battle with the DOH was over, we were up for another round during the IRR. It felt like lobbying for the law all over again. On the points that the DOH opposed and, and lost at Congress, they tried to change it through their own interpretation of the law. We would argue and run to Congresswoman Tan to put in writing the correct interpretation of the law, and this annoyed the DOH. There were many other heated discussions at the IRR, among medical societies and different special inter interest groups like uh, persons with disability group, insurance commission, funding agencies, etc. And one of the things the law provides for is the creation of a cancer council that will formulate policy 
there are five important seats that are not uh, up for government agencies. There are two doctors and three cancer patient group representatives in the council. And as you went through each, each section of the law and got to the part of the composition of the cancer council, a high-ranking government official who was seated beside me and didn't know I was a patient turned to me and said, oh my God, doctor, this is, this is wrong. Why are there more patients? Why are there patients at all in the council? The patients don't know anything. They're gonna drag the whole thing and it's too technical, this is wrong. Don't you agree, doctor? And I was shocked and I reminded him that patient advocates today study and prepare, not to mention they have an expertise no one else has, and that all the fuss of the law was for them. Therefore, they deserve a voice at the council. And that's the other thing, whenever they think you know a little thing, they always call you doctor. They never suspect you're a patient, right, <laughs> Ranjit? <laughs> and indeed, even with the cancer law in place, the recognition of the patient voice has a long way to go, as Azrul had pointed out. And so I was so defensive after that incident. I felt I had to assert the patient voice in the discussions. In fact, when you look at the makeup of the IRR, there was no patient group represent representation. They didn't see the need. They didn't know that two members of the coalition were actually patients. That's why we got in. Other than that, they never gave them a seat. So several weeks into the IRR, there were lesser heated debates and confrontation. There seemed to be more understanding and respect for each other's perspective. I think and I hope there was also better respect for the cancer patient as partner in nation building. We could not afford to be enemies anymore. There's just one enemy, cancer. I think he, the debates always turn healthy because after a while, everyone becomes exhausted, too tired to argue. So that's when one has no choice but to listen. And that's when a true meeting of the minds takes place. And I think the result is we produce a cancer law implementing rules and regulations document that was truly reflective of the aspirations of all the stakeholders. This is a photo of the signing. Oh, sorry. This is a photo of the signing of the document. I mean, it is, just like the law, not perfect, but it's still a consensus and a starting point for all of us. And my sixth tip is to stay vigilant. The passage of the Cancer Act is just the beginning of real work. We have to keep watch and ensure that the law is fully implemented and funded. The price for it to stay relevant and responsive is eternal vigilance. You can easily get blindsided if you stay complacent. One of the last steps before the president signs the bill into law is what you call a bicameral conference, where select members of the Senate and House of Representatives reconcile conflicting provisions in the bill. And just before that bicam conference, we approached again our favorite champion, Congresswoman Tan. We requested her to put in the patient navigation in the law, and she agreed to also increase patient representation to three and lessen the representation of the doctors to two. I mean, anyway, the Department of Health has so many doctors, so we needed more patients. We also requested her to take out the provision that the group of powerful doctors put in with the help of my senator friend. And thankfully, her colleagues at the BICAM agreed, and all of these were approved. And so when the presidential palace announced the cancer law was approved, and we were excited to read the final version, the portion we requested deleted was back in. And luckily though, one thing that the Department of Health agreed with us from before was they also opposed the request of these powerful doctors and they put in a condition that made it impossible for the doctor's plans to happen. But I mean, I don't know how these insertions happen. They're not supposed to happen right after the biogam and just before the president signs. But then again, that's what I meant. You just have to stay vigilant. You never let your eyes off the ball, especially during the home stretch. And um, you can get busy, but never forget why you're doing this. And we are forever grateful to the many cancer patients who supported us during the congressional sessions. Before and after each congressional session, we would meet with them to explain what went on. And right after the law was signed, we staged a patient congress to thank them and explain the law once more. Today, we continue to consult them. We empower them so they are equipped to monitor the full implementation of the cancer law which should happen in a few weeks, and to be sure that cancer is never taken for granted or forgotten again. So sometimes you get lost in the details, we forget the reason for the Cancer Act. It was not about the Cancer Coalition successfully lobbying for a law, and it's not about voting for the senators and congressmen who sponsored and shepherded its way to approval. 
It's what we owe cancer patients. It's restoring their rights. It's what cancer patients deserve. Nothing less than our life's work. That's it. Thank you very much.